Venom Kills, Loma Linda Hospital in California, was at the front line in the race to save lives. Doctors and crews had been able to film these deadly battles as they were being fought in the Venom ER. Dr. Sean Bush was an emergency physician. He headed a team that fought in Venomation. Speed was everything. They were on call 24-7. The busiest times of the year were at the start and end of summer. Throughout these Rattler months, Sean and the team battled hardest against snakebite cases and needed as much crofab as possible, but there was already a major problem. Sean was counting the vials in the hospital stores with pharmacist Norm Amada. Due to a contaminated batch, production had been suspended. Now there was a national shortage. They were down to their last reserves. Without antivenom, people would die. This was going to be a hell of a summer. Sean might have saved lives in the Venom ER, but there was a flip side to Sean the doctor. His passion was for rattlesnakes, at home, he even kept them as pets. Sean might have loved snakes, but they caused his battles at the Venom ER, especially then. Indeed, years have passed since then. It was the busiest time of the year, and the first case was coming in. Sean didn't know exactly what type of rattlesnake was responsible, but Dr. Mary Beth Johnson and nurses started to prepare the antivenom, just in case, because speed was everything. A helicopter was the quickest way to the hospital. Treatments could only begin once Sean had seen the patient and made a diagnosis. On arrival, paramedic Ken McFallis briefed him. 66-year-old Dean Norton had been bitten on the finger. His neighbor was bringing the snake, but it was a two-hour drive. A correct diagnosis was needed right then. It didn't look like Mojave venom. This venom was causing a whole different set of problems. Dean's hand was swelling because the tissue was being digested inside. Sean had to use the antivenom to help stop it. The antivenom was started, but the venom was still advancing, and the pain increased as it advanced. There was a further complication. Dean had a history of heart attacks. The combination of both the venom and the antivenom might have pushed him over the edge, and his symptoms continued to worsen. If the venom continued, it could easily destroy Dean's arm, so they had to continue using more antivenom. But too much could cause serum sickness, which is an allergic reaction. It was a critical balance. They had to wait to see if Dean would be okay. Meanwhile, the neighbor finally arrived with the snake. Mary Beth kept a safe distance. Even a juvenile rattlesnake could be deadly. But Sean had a bigger cause for concern. He said it was a Southern Pacific rattlesnake, and it was right up there with the Mojave in terms of toxicity. It was one of the most toxic snakes in Southern California. He knew the new Crofab antivenom could defeat Mojave venom, but in a lab test against Southern Pacific venom, it had failed. It also dissolved faster than the venom itself. They needed all their experience to help save Dean. The Venomia team was at the front line, but to have any chance of saving life, fast and accurate diagnosis was crucial. But this wasn't always possible. Ten years before then, when Sean was a second-year intern at Loma Linda, he was involved in a case that would profoundly affect his career. Rick Gabrielson had just been spraying bugs in his garden when something happened. Rick had anaphylaxis, which was a severe allergic reaction, but no one knew the exact cause of it. Some thought that it was just an ant, others suspected a Mojave green rattlesnake. Rick went into a coma, if they had known what bit him, they might have been able to treat him faster. But it was too late, Rick had multiple organ failures and died. The exact cause was a mystery. This particular case left everybody at the hospital a little bewildered, and now and then, these animals showed them that they were dangerous, they were deadly, and they could kill. This made Sean get out and read everything he could about snake bites and spider bites, and after that, he'd follow just about every case that presented in Loma Linda. Anybody who had been bitten or stung by anything, Sean would follow them. At the Venom ER, success depended on correct diagnosis and enough antivenom for treatment. Another case was coming in a man bitten while gardening. He didn't see what bit him, but a snake bite was suspected. He was being transferred from another hospital because of an antivenom shortage. 
Sean had already used some of his precious antivenom stocks. Initial signs suggested this was serious. Although 63-year-old Robert Hamilton didn't see what bit him, the evidence for Rattler and Venomation was clear. His wife pieced together the story. She said he thought he got stuck by a thorn, he never saw the snake, and then ran inside their house. He then told her they had better go to a hospital because he thought he got bitten by a snake. The venom was advancing up Robert's arm, causing it to swell. It looked like a Southern Pacific bite. Sean marked the arm to see how far the venom was advancing. They might have known what bit him, but there was a problem. The venom was thinning his blood, his platelets were low as an effect of the venom. According to Sean, when platelets became too low, they could bleed spontaneously. They could bleed into their GI tract or their brain. Two hours had passed, but Dr. Jim Frenchick observed the venom was still creeping. Sean knew the antivenom ran out faster than the venom, so they had to keep one step ahead of it. It was a game of cat and mouse, time was tissue, and Robert's age worsened the symptoms. People at extremes of age, particularly older people, tended to do worse after a snake bite. Robert's wife said that that was what she was concerned about. Correct diagnosis of the cause of the bite helped target the treatment. It gave the team more of a chance to shorten the odds. In this game, everything was learned the hard way. The case involving 43-year-old Keith Julian was to be one of the most perplexing cases of Sean's career. This rattlesnake was to change everything Sean knew about Venom. Rattlesnakes don't go looking for trouble. We are too big to be their prey. But sometimes, if we get too close, a rattler's only alternative is to defend itself. Unfortunately, Keith didn't notice the classic warning signs until it was too late. By the time he got to the hospital, the venom was affecting his nerves. His heart had stopped beating. It looked like a typical Mojave Green envenomation. But Keith knew snakes and said otherwise. He said it was a Southern Pacific that bit him. Southern Pacific venom should have attacked tissue, not nerves. Time was ticking away. This confusion wouldn't help target Keith's treatment, particularly as Sean was still field testing the Nucrofab antivenom. If it was a Southern Pacific rattlesnake, it would have serious implications for venom research. This was the part of the job that made the team most nervous, except for Sean, of course. It was best to keep a safe distance. This snake meant venom was changing. It was significant news for Sean. It might have been exciting news, but it was a mystery wide. One possibility was the snake could have had the Mojave toxin in its venom. That could have happened for many different reasons. It could have happened because either the snakes were interbreeding, or the snake venom was evolving to be more toxic to kill a certain type of prey because some experts had postulated there might be an arms race going on between venomous animals and their prey. Keith was under intense observation overnight on a course of antivenom. Now venom was changing. Doctors had to fight to stay one step ahead. Keith needed another two weeks in the hospital, but he survived. The case opened another chapter in Sean's work. He studied venom with Dr. Bill Hayes at Loma Linda University. Venom research was a dangerous business. Snakes needed to be milked for their venom. Just one bite could kill. But this work was critical for our survival. Venom and blood samples could be analyzed. Bill had already discovered crucial information that might help save lives. His results had shown that venom from some juvenile snakes contained more nerve-targeting components than adults and that much more venom was delivered in defensive bites. The more we know, the better our chances of fighting the next cases. We know that rattlesnakes don't eat us, yet every year, hundreds of people get bitten. Sean Bush knew why. According to him, most bites occurred when someone was handling the snake, molesting the snake, trying to kill the snake, and in some way, they were putting themselves in contact with the snake when they didn't have to. Most bites can be avoided. It is the people who underestimate or are taking the animal for granted and they handle or pick it up and think it is harmless, and that is when they get bitten. But some people never learn their lesson. At the Venom ER, another case was coming in. A 23-year-old male had been bitten on the left hand by a rattlesnake. It was another battle against venom. There was still a national antivenom shortage due to a contaminated batch. And a call to the stores confirmed Sean's fears. 
Existing supplies were dangerously low. Matthew Perez had tried to pick up a Southern Pacific rattlesnake. Perhaps he had underestimated the danger. His hand was swelling. Sean had to determine how much swelling was caused by venom and how much could be due to an allergic reaction. Misdiagnosis could be fatal. The team played the game of cat and mouse, tracking the swelling to keep one step ahead of the venom. But it looked as though the venom was already far advanced. They had to decide how much antivenom to give him. But with two cases already that week, no one knew how much longer the supplies would hold out. Sean made the critical decision. Matthew was put on a maintenance dose, hopefully just enough to keep one step ahead of the venom. But there was more trouble in store, another case. They had just called Sean from 29 Palms Hospital. They said they had a patient there with a snake bite and they were having a hard time getting the old antivenom going into solution, which was a problem with the old antivenom. Wyeth was the older antivenom, but Crofab stocks were getting so low that hospitals were having to use it as a last resort. But now even the Wyeth was being used up. Wendy Flickinger had been bitten while rescuing her daughter from a snake. The snake itself had been brought in decapitated by her neighbor and safely contained. Her story was featured in a previous video entitled The Terrifying and Deadly Side Wind a Snake Bite, Eric and Wendy's Story. Most people think that juvenile snakes don't look dangerous since they are very small. They are not very imposing like an adult rattlesnake and the baby rattlesnake's rattle don't make a sound. Since they are not as scary, and even if they make a little rattle, a kid might think it is a plaything. Sean had had to treat such a case before, but this time, the mother wasn't able to protect her baby. Unaware of any danger, Martha Shake was playing with her two children at home near Burning. Two-year-old Megan thought she had found another toy. In fact, it was a juvenile Southern Pacific rattlesnake. The venom was already destroying tissue, Martha knew she had to get her daughter to the ER as soon as possible. This was a worst-case scenario for Sean. There was a lot of venom in a very small body. It was a new test for the new Crofab antivenom and Sean, but too much antivenom could cause nerve damage. It would be some weeks before Sean knew for sure if Megan would keep her finger. The family had returned for a checkup. Thankfully, there had been a huge improvement since she was bitten. Despite the fact that time was tissue, Megan made a complete recovery. It was thanks to the new antivenom and the speed of her treatment. But there was no time to relax because there was yet another new case. Drew Smith had waited 12 hours since being bitten, precious time, especially during an antivenom shortage. Sean still had a few boxes in the ER and was just making sure that each one was full. He had only eight vials and understood that the patient had already gotten Crofab at the other hospital. They had less than 20 vials in the hospital at that time. That was barely enough to treat one patient. This would be a serious challenge in the Venom ER even worse than Megan's case. Drew already needed more vials than anticipated. He had only had four so far. Tissue destruction had advanced. They might already be too late. One of the reasons Drew waited so long was that he had tried to treat himself by cutting the wound to suck out the venom and applying a tourniquet. This had just made the problem worse. It is not recommended anymore, and it doesn't work. Drew had learned that when he was a Boy Scout in the 70s, but we don't follow that advice anymore. A lot of people are still under that misconception. To add to the problems, Drew had developed a rash all over his body, but Sean wasn't sure why. He had only ever treated one other speckled rattlesnake bite with Crofab. The situation was getting worse. With so much advanced swelling, there was no alternative but to call Surgeon Unikim for an examination. Drew had developed compartment syndrome. The pressure from swelling was restricting blood supply, and some of the tissue was now dead and being digested. But there was even more pressure built up. Dr. Kim had to cut Drew's arm open to remove the dead flesh and try to prevent further tissue destruction before it was too late. As surgeons battled to save Drew's arm, Sean had to check on four of the patients he had had that week. All were now in intensive care. The first was Dean Norton, the 63-year-old man with a history of heart attacks 
who was bitten on the finger by a southern Pacific rattlesnake while trying to protect his dog. Sean thought he was going to survive. Sean's next patient was Matthew Perez, the 23-year-old who had tried to pick up a rattlesnake. Sean said he was okay after examining him to and told him to take it easy. Next was Robert Hamilton, who had been bitten by an unseen snake that caused his blood to thin. Sean said it was all good after examining him and that he got to keep the arm. Robert was really happy about that. Finally, Wendy Flickinger, who had had severe breathing difficulties following an attack from a baby sidewinder, was doing well too. At least she was able to save her daughter from the snake bite. Sean was glad that she was doing all right as she shook his hand. Wendy's brother, who was at her bedside, thanked Sean for taking care of his sister. All for Venomier patients were okay, but there was still one more, Drew Smith. It would be some hours before Sean knew if Drew would keep his arm. Sean was not only on call in the hospital, though. He and his wife Emmy, like many others, lived in rattlesnake country. They had had an urgent call from their neighbors. Throughout the summer, many rattlesnakes came out into the sun to warm themselves. They wouldn't come after you. So to avoid an accident, just keep a safe distance and call an expert who could relocate the snake away from human contact. In one week, Sean had rescued a beloved rattlesnake and four patients, and had heard antivenom production was starting again. But he couldn't relax until he checked the one remaining patient, Drew Smith. Thanks to the ER team, Drew would be okay. The lesson to be learnt is that, if you have a snake bite, you should present it to emergency care as soon as possible. The first thing you should do is get to a hospital after a snake bite. You shouldn't wait because it just makes things worse, more swelling more surgery, and people die about waiting. The San Bernardino Sheriff's Air Division was heading in with the next challenge, an 18-year-old male. They retrieved Jason from a forestry station northwest of Loma Linda and got him to the ER in under 30 minutes, saving vital minutes of tissue damage. Even so, his foot was already bruised and swollen. Brandy Basavo was the ER's charge nurse that day. Her team was already preparing the crowfab. The first task for Sean was to define the area of tissue damage. At that moment, the team didn't know what type of snake had bitten Jason, but there was a clue in the location. Just one hour earlier, he had been with his family at Lado Creek just 20 miles from the hospital. In the cool of the hills, it was a popular picnic spot and home to southern Pacific rattlesnakes. Young snakes were small and in dappled light. They were perfectly camouflaged. He had been just too close to this one. Jason had no idea what kind of snake had bitten him. A first response was vital. Sean Bush knew that Lado Creek was Southern Pacific Territory and Jason had both swelling and neurotoxic symptoms. The first dose of antivenom went in and Jason started to improve. After 10 vials of antivenom, Jason was okay to go home. By mid-snake bite season, Loma Linda had already used over 300 vials of Crofab, far more than at the same time the previous year. To keep up with demand, the lab in Salt Lake City had to process industrial quantities of venom.